Good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Hutchison. I'm with Gilead Sciences. On behalf of Gilead Sciences, welcome to Connect 17. Looks to be a fantastic conference. Um, I want to welcome uh, Speaker Pro Tem Kevin Mullen, Assembly Member Mark Berman, Supervisor Warren Slocum, and Sam Cita, President and CEO Roseanne Faust. I want to tell you a little bit about Gilead. Um, since the theme of the conference is disruption, uh, we like to pride ourselves on disrupting, at least in the healthcare space. Um, we are 30 years and celebrating our 30 year anniversary uh, this year. Um, Gilead, just to, I think, a great way to explain Gilead is you had 30 pills about 20 years ago for HIV, you now have a single pill. Uh, just four years ago, there wasn't a cure for HCV. Now there's a cure, one pill, eight weeks. That's disruptive to the system and it's what we want to do for our patients. So we're always working constantly to meet unmet medical need. Another area that we're working on is Ebola. Um, so again, from the public health side, what would it happen if we could get a cure for Ebola? So I just wanted to welcome, explain who we are. Um, we're also a big partner here in the community. We work closely with our assemblymen and the local uh, councils. Um, Gilead has invested about $3 billion. You're sitting here in our new conference facility um, in the state uh, over the past five years. So again, being part of the community, being an economic driver, and being disruptor is who we are. So thank you. I hope you have a wonderful conference and um, a great day. Good morning, everybody. All right, just a little insider story. Uh, Everybody knows Marcy Dragan, my legislative aide, right? Everybody knows her. So Casey was her mentor at one point in life. So Casey, thank you for that. And she says it's the other way around. I don't know. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Warren Bennis, Warren Bennis, a noted leadership expert, said, quote, the factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to keep the man from touching any of the equipment. <laughs> In that case, the dog is the disruptive technology. And you could say that the dog is what this year's Connect 17, 17 event is focused on disruptive technologies that impact our communities. And as some of you know, we've enjoyed four Connect conferences um, in the past several years, and each one has been better than the last. And I promise you that this year's event is going to be the best ever. So I want everybody, when the speakers come up, to sit up straight and behave, because we're going to live stream this on Facebook. Hopefully that'll work. Thank you, Krista, for doing that. We appreciate it. Um, but we f before we go any further, let me offer some thank yous to folks, and thank you to Casey for uh, hosting us today, and a sincere thanks to Gilead for generously hosting us on their campus. I don't know about you, but when I drove through, I was a little lost. I was amazed at the development here in Foster City and how fast this corporation is growing. We're honored to be here, obviously. Our host today is one of the preeminent biopharmaceutical uh, companies in the world, an innovator and leader, and relatively new to this space with just 30 years in business of improving lives. Gilead develops medicines, as you heard, for areas of unmet medical needs such as HIV AIDS drugs, and it is, as she said earlier, a disruptive biopharma company. Thank you to Assemblyman Mark Berman. Mark, thank you for coming, who represents the 24th District, which includes a portion of the peninsula and much of Silicon Valley. And also Sam Cetus CEO, Roseanne Faust, whose mission is to promote business issues that enhance and sustain the economic prosperity of our region and its local communities. We appreciate your collaboration in making this conference possible. Plus, you're really good people and fun to work with. Wouldn't you agree, Kevin? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you both. I also want to personally thank my senior legislative aide, Marcy Dragan, who does such a wonderful 
great, fantastic job at organizing uh, our District 4 events, and this conference is no exception. She's a tireless worker and organized beyond belief. That's why I'm always on time to events, because of Marcy. So thank you, Marcy Dragon. Go ahead, give it up. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at Connect 17. While we do this as a labor of love, and because we find the changing technology landscape so interesting and have for so many years, but it just wouldn't be the same without an engaged, inspired, and knowledgeable audience like you. I'm proud to serve in this county, San Mateo County, where the leadership and local government is interested in the topics that we cover in these Connect conferences. Kevin, Mark, and I find our roles as legislators are being challenged as we think about what government should or should not do to foster disruptive technologies and how to prepare infrastructure, regulations, and laws for innovations like driverless cars. As we kick off Connect 17, you'll be introduced to people who are changing the way we have approached some of the most fundamental aspects of our lives. Giving over personal data to doctors and schools and how that data is used, voting, hacking, and the integrity of our democracy, autonomous cars, and well, just about everything. Let me share with you a brief introduction about disruptive technologies that might be helpful for some. Disruptive refers to an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market-leading firms, products, and alliances. But not all innovations are disruptive, even if they are revolutionary. For instance, the first automobile in the late 19th century, uh, the first automobiles in the late 19th century were not, were not a disruptive technology technology, because early automobiles were expensive luxury items that did not disrupt the market for horse-drawn carriages. The market for transportation essentially remained intact until the debut of the lower-priced Ford Model T in 1908. The mass-produced automobile was a disruptive innovation because it changed the transportation market, whereas the first 30 years of automobiles did not. So here are some examples of some disruptions that are taking place now and will affect uh, certainly our lives. And I'd invite you to think about these and the implications of each one of them. Um, I've taken the liberty also of adding a few comments about each one of these uh, disruptions. So think about this. Robots become coworkers. Robots become coworkers. Obviously, this has significant consequences for our workplaces, for places like this. And I suppose on the lighter side, the funny part about that is that there will be no more arguments about the temperature being too hot or too cold in our offices, because frankly, robots don't give a damn. <laughs> Next, wearables like Fitbit to implantables, so wearables to implantables. We will have an opportunity to become somewhat of a human cyborg. As an example, every day, about three million Americans have to take a syringe, prick their skin with a needle, and then inject themselves with insulin. Imagine if every one of those diabetes sufferers had a device fitted inside their body that measured their sugar levels, and automatically released insulin as and when required. Pretty amazing, wouldn't you say? Also saw last night on, um, I think it was Charlie Rose, there was a little advertisement on the side there where um, there are actually pills now that have a little sensor in them. And when you swallow the pill, it, transmit to the, it transmits to the doctor's office to say, Oh, Kevin took his pill. Uh, pretty amazing, isn't it? Next, next, bots. Everybody knows what a bot is, right? 
bots usurp apps and websites. This is how we're all going to communicate in the future, through, through bots. We're all going to have our individual bots. And some people would say to you that um, we're all tired of all these apps on our phones and all the updating that occurs and all that sort of thing. And imagine a future where you have one icon on your phone and it's your bot and it will do several things for you from ordering food to ordering up music, et cetera. Um, so bots will replace websites and apps at some point. Think about genetically modified life forms. This is the stuff that was previously the sole purview of science fiction novels and movies. And it causes me to think about the bar scene in Star Wars where we meet that notorious figure Jabba the Hutt, one of the galaxy's most powerful gangsters. But genetically modified life forms, you've all seen this on the news. It's not necessarily new. Artificial intelligence replaces white collar expertise. The world of work definitely changes when the computer in the back room is running our offices. That's a possibility. And finally, the last one that I'll mention is that robots, robots who teach themselves. Question is, what will they teach? Could they be teaching for evil purposes? something to think about. Well, friends, I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, it's always rewarding to come to Connect 17 after months of planning and preparation and corralling speakers. As I say, I'm excited to get this day started. I appreciate everyone being here. I'd like to turn it over, <clears throat> excuse me, to my uh, good friend and longtime colleague who uh, together we dreamed about years and years ago, 20 years ago, having these Connect conferences. And here we are. We finally did it. Kevin Mullen. Thank, Thank you, sir. Kevin. Thank you very much, Supervisor. And it's, it was Warren's vision many years ago uh, that has resulted in this conference. So thank you, sir, uh, for your leadership. Um, I'm a little freaked out after Warren's comments about what the future may or may not hold for us. Excited and a little bit freaked out, I guess. But um, honored to be with all of you. Uh, pleased to uh, be hosting yet another Connect conference. And I would like to add my thanks to Casey Hutchinson and the staff here at Gilead for hosting us. Uh, a welcome to my colleague, Assemblymember Mark Berman. He did not get the memo that we don't wear ties at Connect 17, but he looks sharp, so <laughs> he, he wins the day. Um, he is joining us as a host and sponsor along with our uh, longtime co-host, Roseanne Faust. So thank you uh, to the leadership team here. And I want to take a moment to thank my staff who are sprinkled throughout the room, in particular, uh, Mario Rendon, who is my district director, who was very active in the, in the planning. So uh, thank you, Mario, and my staff for all that you do. So as I prepared my remarks, or Mario helped me prepare my remarks, uh, I took a look back at the past year and reflected on what has happened in the world of technology. This year, Apple celebrated the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, a device that has revolutionized how we live, work, and play. So a quick show of hands. I own a smartphone. Yes, most everybody here. I check my phone within the first five minutes after I wake up. You can admit it. It's OK, everybody. We're here. We're here together to support one another. <laughs> I check my phone at least five minutes before I go to sleep, which is really ill-advised, as I understand it, <laughs> if you actually want to sleep. And you may not want to answer. I only put my phone down when I fall asleep. In my case, it like falls out of bed. But. So it should come as no surprise that the average American adult, 18 years or older, spends two hours and 51 minutes on their smartphone every day. Millennials, those aged 18 to 32, check their phone on average 150 times a day. Psychologists and neurobiologists are researching how text messages, social media posts, and emails all contribute to the release of dopamine in the human brain. It's that same neurotransmitter that rewards you for accomplishing a goal. Every time we receive a notification, 
on our smartphone. It's that Pavlovian cue that a reward is on its way. We are prompted by the apps we download on our device to provide information, and that information is then used to send notifications when certain conditions are met. We enable notification and GPS tracking without really thinking about it, and all of this information, on top of what we consciously provide, is collected and cataloged. Your mobile phone is a window into your life. On your phone, we can discover your family, friends, and coworkers with all their personal information, your personal correspondence, your daily schedule, your travel, your taste in food, music, and film, your health status, your shopping habits, your banking and other financial information, and the lists go on. And your mobile phone is also a window to the world. Those instant notifications bring us the latest news, both important and trivial. We can witness historic events or participate in a conference like today. We can mobilize and engage instantaneously. And in our hand is a tool to access more information than is contained in many libraries. A decade into this new era, I'd like to think our phones have made the world a little smaller and our lives a little bit easier. Yet we still have to contemplate what happens with all the information that is collected about us and how to keep it safe. Thus, part of our morning will discuss those very concerns. As in years past, our ask of you remains the same. How do we harness technology in all of its variations and with all of its benefits and challenges to better serve those we represent? I hope today's program will provide some guidance. Just a few housekeeping items. Our Connect Talks this morning will be live streamed using Facebook Live from Supervisor Slocum's page and my official Facebook page, as opposed to the unofficial Facebook page, which you don't want to look at. Um, please make sure to share on your organization's Facebook page as well. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that thanks to Penn TV, today's conference is being recorded and videos will be available at our website for the conference, www. Do people say that anymore? www. Okay, just connectsmc.org. And make sure you have downloaded the Connect app so you can follow along and engage with others. On a final note, for those of you using social media, we encourage you to use hashtag ConnectSMC on Twitter and Facebook and make sure that you follow us. And again, a final thank you to Casey and Gilead. I'm the chairman of the Select Committee on Biotechnology and we are so very proud uh, to have Gilead uh, here in the 22nd Assembly District. And with that, I turn it over to my colleague and, and legislative partner, somebody uh, I am so proud uh, to call a friend and, uh, and legislative partner here on the peninsula and a new partner on Connect, uh, the Connect Project, and that is Assemblymember Mark Berman. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I'm glad to join you and Warren and Roseanne uh, this morning, as well as all of you. Uh, how many of you are attending your first Connect talk, your first Connect 17? That's great, about maybe a third of the crowd, a half of the crowd. Um, while Connect Talks have been a constant since the first conference five years ago, this is my fir first Connect Talk as well, so we're gonna be learning, uh, I'm gonna be learning along with you, and the first thing I learned this morning is that I don't need to wear a tie. So thanks for the heads up on that again, Kevin, Warren, you're great. Um, Connect Talks provide a snapshot of new technologies and ideas modeled after TED Talks. For those of you not familiar with the concept, TED is a nonprofit organization devoted to ideas worth spreading. It started in 1984 as a conference bringing together people from the worlds of technology, entertainment, and design, thus TED. S since then, its scope has become ever broader, and you can learn more about it at TED.com. Now here's the key. TED conferences bring together the world's most fascinating thinkers and doers who are challenged to give the talk of their lives in 18 minutes or less. However, since our presenters are twice as impressive as the folks who give TED Talks, we're giving them half the time. So they have nine minutes to present the talk of their lives. Uh, we have three Connect Talks interspersed between the panels. You're gonna learn about some fascinating things that are happening at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, elections, and mobility. And because our agenda is so tight, we're gonna dispense with formal introductions and speaker bios. This is the point where I normally say you can read the bios in your program, but as you can all see, we've gone paperless and you don't have programs. So instead, you can read all of the bios on the Connect app. And if you're having trouble downloading the app, uh, downloading the app there are folks at the front desk who can help you uh, go through that process. 
That said, our, fir our first Connect Talk presenter, uh, Chris Finan, is a good friend of mine, and I'm grateful that he's taking time out of his busy day running a startup to come impart some wisdom. Uh, let me ask, who likes to start their day before 9 a.m. talking about cybersecurity? Anybody, any going once, going, I saw three hands. Uh, well, you're in luck, because that's what Chris is gonna be talking about. Chris will share his expertise in developing cybersecurity policy in the Obama administration, and what we in the public sector should be doing to secure our most sensitive information. So with that, please join me in welcoming Chris Finan. Thank you, Assemblymen. Thank you, Supervisor. Thanks. Um, so actually, because of the topic you told me about, I prepared an interpretive dance. <laughs> Hope that's okay. I figured that'd go a little bit better this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I served about uh, 14 years uh, in federal service and uh, recently came out to California. And um, it was really great to, to leave that time behind and just be a citizen again. Uh, and it's always really energizing for me to come to events like this that are extremely well put together. Uh, you've got you know, local leadership that's uh, putting a lot of time and thought, great staffing uh, into these topics. Because when I think about government, after reflecting on that time, I think about what Barney Frank used to say that government is really just what we choose to do together. Uh, and so today I'll just talk to you a little bit about things that as a community uh, I think we need to be worried about. Uh, and it's, it's really not a cybersecurity talk because ultimately, uh, and I'm, I'm a tech entrepreneur, this is my third company, uh, and I will tell you uh, I'm the first to admit that um, things don't change because of technology. Things change when people are enabled by technology. Uh, and they change the way that institutions work, they change processes, they break down barriers. Uh, and so, you know, when I think about this problem that we have, and I, I do very much believe that um, the undermining of the integrity of our institutions is an existential threat to our democracy, uh, it's not going to be some tech magic bullet that, that solves it. It's going to be all of us working together. Because at the end of the day, this is about trust. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, trust, again, are the things that we choose not only to do together, but to believe together. Now, trust often can be found in data. But as we've seen recently, data can be interpreted many different ways. And often, it's the loudest voices who carry the day, not the most correct ones. Uh, so some of what I'll talk to you about is what happens when that data, uh, whether it's through interpretation or whether it's through manipulation, uh, is actually undermined? What does that do to our institutions? Um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to highlight this article that I found, uh, and particularly the date. This really shouldn't be a surprise to us. Look at what's happened in the last year, what's happened to our democracy. Um, we, we should have seen this coming, and yet we didn't. I think some of that was a failure of our elected leadership, but really it was more a failure, I think, of all of us to not take this risk seriously and understand how fragile our institutions and indeed the rule of law is. Um, and I, you know, at least for me, the last year has really driven that home. That trust is what undergirds the rule of law more than any document. Um, but I will pause it here, I'll give you the, the bottom line up front, that data manipulation, the idea that a hacker could come in and actually change zeros to ones, say in an email trove or even um, on a Twitter account. Does everyone remember what happened two weeks ago? Twitter contractor breaks in to the president's personal email account, which he's now using as his official email account, and shuts it down. That same access could have sent out a new tweet. Could have sent out a tweet that said, hey, I just fired a nuclear missile at the Korean Peninsula. What would have happened in response? What would have happened to the markets? So the idea that you can actively undermine the data, uh, I posit, 
is much more pernicious than what we've known as cybersecurity, or we traditionally thought of cybersecurity risks in the past, which is a hacker is going to go in and they're going to steal my credit card information. They're going to steal my account credentials. Uh, I actually believe now those risks um, are really secondary to what a hacker could do, likely a sp state sponsored one, could do by going in and changing a database so that we're now interpreting uh, results that are much different than they should be. But I want to give you a couple examples of what this really means. And uh, maybe I'll tell a story or two. So the first one is NASDAQ. NASDAQ, and there's been a more recent breach, unfortunately, but back in 2011, I was working in the White House for President Obama uh, on cybersecurity policy. And there was a breach of the NASDAQ. And there were, was a time of about two or three days when no one really knew how bad it was. And there was a concern that the data in the NASDAQ transaction systems may have been, again, manipulated. When you think about that systemic risk, now all of a sudden no one knows what the real value of the market is. What could that do? It's, it's the risk of undermining the system as a whole, of people losing confidence in that trading platform, and indeed potentially in the entire economy. So when people used to ask me, hey, what keeps folks in the West Wing up at night? It was this kind of, of cybersecurity risk. It was so bad that we were actually running the response out of the situation room, which is pretty unheard of. Uh, it was really taken seriously by the very highest levels of government. It turned out to be not as bad as we, as we uh, thought it could be. Uh, but again, the risk is there, and it's a very real one. So on your left, that's the Indian Nuclear Command and Control Center. And on the right is the Pakistani one, a few hundred miles away. Um, you'll notice big screens shows you whether there are missiles inbound. Uh, how hard do you think it is for a hacker, if they get into that network, to put something up on that screen and make the other side think that there's something being launched? Uh, so that's the type of manipulation uh, that we're talking about. Likewise, uh, the Pentagon has this problem. So you may not know this, but any time we go to war, and we're doing that a lot, it seems, recently, 90% uh, of all our military troops, our supplies, uh, I myself flew to war on a civilian airliner, 90% um, of all our military troops and supplies are transported by the civilian sector. And all of that coordination takes place over the internet. Uh, so what happens if, you know, like, when I got to Iraq, all of my guns and my bullets ended up in Qatar or in South Korea. Uh, what, if, what happens if you did that at scale? Uh, you can really throw a wrench into a nation's ability to mobilize and go to war uh, to protect things, especially when the stakes are very high. And of course, uh, you know, when I first uh, introduced this slide at a talk almost a year ago, um, this wasn't really in the news, and people were kind of scratching their heads. Why are you talking about this? I guess it's pretty all uh, pretty evident to all of us now. But um, the idea that you can actually hack an ele election system, you can hack the voter registration rolls and change things. Um, and you know, you may not need to change the results. You may just need to do enough to undermine people's faith in the results, uh, or even create turmoil for the next two years. Uh, so uh, the research is pretty convincing that, um, that it's easy to do this remotely, at least for specific systems, maybe not writ large, but to go and cherry pick a few key systems. So what does it all mean? I'm a tech guy. There's some tech things that we can do to mitigate the risk, but as I said, it really does take people. It takes, uh, I don't care if you're working at a nonprofit, if you're working at a school, uh, if you're working at the local, state, or federal level of government, uh, it takes everybody to be aware, uh, to have good security practices across the board. Uh, and there are some tech things that you can do. Uh, but focusing on ensuring the integrity, uh, that is really key. And then assuming that you're never going to keep a hacker out of a system. A determined, I will tell you this, I've been in cybersecurity for a long, long time. A determined hacker who's well-resourced 
will always, always be able to penetrate a system. Uh, even separating that system from the internet. Um, as we've seen uh, with things like the Stuxnet, Stuxnet virus, um, they can even hop those air gaps. And there are new solutions like blockchains, things like that, that can help. But again, there's no panacea. You've got to take a layered approach. Uh, often having backups, having resiliency uh, is very important. Having paper backups is really important. And ultimately, as we think about policy prescriptions, I think the questions that we need to be asking are, how can we incentivize investments in these types of new technologies? How can we deter that type of manipulation at scale by uncovering it, holding those account accountable that were either complicit uh, or even uh, actively colluded? And then I'll leave you with um, <laughs> this, which I saw on the news just like two weeks ago. Uh, we just have to make ourselves a harder target. So you might want to change your password or just start with not putting it on your computer when you're going to do a live uh, NBC broadcast. <laughs> so thank you all. Uh, thank you all for hosting me and uh, have a great day. Chris, thank you so much for a thought provoking presentation. We are going to transition to our panel discussion. Big data versus the dark side. Government has been a storehouse of information that through advancing technology can now be more effectively cataloged, analyzed, and implemented. And government big data troves are attractive to those that would capitalize by its misuse. Over the past year, numerous cyber attacks have paralyzed or caused substantial harm to the private and public sectors. The most recent and far-reaching is, of course, Equifax. Our panel will explore how big data can be safely shared and utilized and how sensitive information is protected. Joining the conversation, I would, and I would welcome them up to the panel, as well as my co-moderator, uh, Warren Slocum. Joining the conversation is Michael McNerney with Technology for Global Security, Victoria Verising with Palantir and Rod Ogawa with the Silicon Valley Data Trust. If Michael, Victoria, and Rod could join me on the panel. Very good. <laughs> so we'll let them get situated. We are going to um, start with Michael. Uh, each of our uh, panelists will present. And then what we really want to do is open this up uh, to the audience so we can get a little bit of a dialogue going here uh, with, with our panelists. So Michael, this is Michael McNerney with Technology for Global Security. Why don't we go ahead and start with you? And I hope your mic is working. If not, I'm just going to go ahead and hand this to you. <laughs> That's right, kind of belt and suspenders here. Is this, is this working OK? All right, terrific. We can holster that bad guy. Um, OK, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this, uh, I love coming here and talking about security. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm, I'm one of those people that thinks about security first thing in the morning, God help me. Um, thanks as well to Chris Finan. Um, Chris and I actually used to work together in DC back in the day. Uh, when he said he was in federal service, he meant he was working for Barack Obama, not that he was in prison. Um, I thought I would make that, make that clear. Uh, Chris was uh, basically my counterpart uh, at the White House. Uh, I worked for the Secretary of Defense in cybersecurity. Um, I learned a lot from Chris during that time, and I still learn something new from him every time uh, I hear him talk. So thank you for those remarks. Um, what I thought I would do, I think Chris laid out a really great strategic framework for the threats that we're facing. Maybe I'll take that down just one more level uh, and, and hopefully come up with some more operational and, and tactical things and practical things that we can think about uh, doing in terms of security. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we do is really kind of come up with a, a strategy for handling security. Uh, when people throw around terms like cybersecurity and whether it's being applied to big data or to elections, um, it kind of has this tendency to mean all things to all people. Uh, and that can be overwhelming. And so in order to get our hands wrapped around this, I think it's helpful to kind of 
parse it down into something that's a little bit more manageable. Um, now I realize I had the benefit of, of working at a place like the Pentagon, which has a, a half a trillion dollar budget and, and two million people and some of the greatest uh, cybersecurity specialists in the world. Uh, so not all of the lessons that I learned there are going to be applicable to everybody in this room. Um, but I think some of the lessons learned might be, and that's kind of what I want to impart. So in terms of a strategy, I think it, uh, it's helpful to begin uh, by uh, looking at it in two frameworks. The first is external and the second is internal. So if you're trying to defend your own network and your own enterprise, uh, it's really important to think about what is the nature of the threat that you're facing externally? Um, what are the trends? Uh, Chris did a really good job of, of saying that uh, you know, we weren't really expecting information to be used against us uh, in the way that it was in this last year. That's a new trend. That's something that we weren't ready for, uh, although I think we should have been. Um, and so staying in front of these trends is really important. A couple years ago, it was really about you know, uh, identity theft. That was like the big thing. And uh, denial of service attacks. And while those still go on, we've seen an evolution in the kinds of threat that we're facing. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of ransomware attacks um, and ransomware attacks increasingly targeting um, you know, middle and small businesses, schools. Uh, we're seeing that proliferate dramatically. Uh, again, as Chris mentioned, we're seeing the use of information being used uh, against people in, in a way that it hadn't been before. So staying ahead of the actual, uh, the bad guys uh, and what their latest techniques are and why they're doing what they're doing is really important. Um, you know, kind of pay attention to the Willie Sutton rule, if you will. Uh, you rob banks because that's where the money is. Um, what are these people after uh, and why would they be targeting you? And then that brings you to the second part of this, which is the internal analysis. Um, so you need to take a hard look at yourself, both individually and as an organization, uh, and think about what does your security posture look like. Um, and one of the very first places that you should start is with your customers and with your employees. As we are increasingly becoming aware, all of us are kind of on the front lines in a cyber incident, right? Everybody who is a, an employee of your agency or of your company, every customer that accesses your website um, is a potential uh, person that a hacker can access and use them to get access to your enterprise. And so making sure that your employees and your customers and yourselves are uh, educated, that you're trained and that you're resourced um, to understand the nature of the threat and take basic security measures is very important. Um, security is oftentimes thought of in terms of kind of 80-20. There are just a couple things you can do that get you 80% of where you need to be. Um, and really getting your people trained and educated, uh, doing basic cyber hygiene is that 80%. These are things that we all know about. Strong username and password. Um, Implementing multi-factor authentication, uh, which is kind of like, for those who don't know, almost like a third password. Um, that is <clears throat> tremendously important. Uh, it's available for almost all of your technology providers, Google, Gmail, Dropbox. All of these services offer multi-factor authentication. Um, frankly, had we been offering multi-factor and implementing multi-factor authentication in things like OPM, which was hacked, uh, Arguably, that would have stopped that. So uh, simple things like that are, are incredibly important. And then the educational element of that as well, making sure that people know that they are, in fact, potentially being targeted. Um, and that means that they should be very careful about the websites that they visit, very careful about the emails that they open and the links that they click on. Um, that right there is really, really important. Now, once you have uh, the kind of hygiene portion of this you know, kind of squared away, and you have a great program for that, then you need to take a really strategic look at your own critical assets. Uh, you know, security is really oftentimes about trade-offs and about balancing. We can't secure everything 100% gold-plated all of the time, right? Uh, we don't all have the resources of, of some place like the Pentagon. Um, you know, security is expensive. Uh, you know, it's resource intensive. It takes expertise. Um, and so, you know, doing a little bit of triage is really important. So analyzing what are your critical assets? This is a conversation about big data. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing that data itself is really, really valuable to 
uh, to attackers. Um, they can use that data to, you know, sell it on the black market. They can manipulate that data uh, to undermine you or your agency's mission or your company's mission. Uh, or they can use it to embarrass you publicly like they did uh, with the DNC, right? So, um, Perhaps data itself is your core uh, asset that you need to protect. Um, perhaps it's credit card uh, information if you're a small business. If you're a small bank, it may be customer accounts. Um, so identifying that, uh, that is really, really important. I will say, because there, there are a number of politicians in the room, um, actual communications are really important, right? The, the basically the gossip that goes on within your organizations, that can be used against you. Um, and has been used against you, and I think that that will, uh, I think that that will be a trend that continues. And once you've identified that kind of really critical asset, then you can start to ask yourself, what can we do to protect that? Um, do we need to keep this around, right? Do we need to, for example, keep emails forever, or should we delete them? Um, do we need to have all of these systems connected to the internet all the time, or should they be air-gapped? Uh, should everybody in the organization have access to these critical assets or should only a few trusted people have these uh, accesses? Um, are we using the right level of encryption? Um, you know, what does our actual security stack look like and, and what solutions are we actually buying to protect these assets? Um, and so that lets you have a, a much more manageable outlook on how to protect what's important without overstretching your security teams. And then finally, uh, which I think is the value of something like this, is uh, really to collaborate, to work with other people, uh, to learn from other organizations. One of the things that we set up uh, when I was at the Pentagon was uh, an information sharing alliance between uh, the Department of Defense and a number of defense industrial based agencies that has since morphed into uh, something that's much broader. And now there are many, many different uh, alliances. Uh, the healthcare sector has a very robust one. The financial services sector has a very robust one uh, where uh, you know, oftentimes competitors will come together uh, and share information about a common threat and learn uh, the latest techniques uh, and procedures to protect themselves, learn about the latest trends uh, from attackers, and just generally, you know, kind of raise everybody's security posture. So collaborating, sharing information, learning from each other, and uh, attending conferences like this, uh, I think, are, are the last kind of really important piece uh, to begin thinking about how to secure ourselves more practically. So um, with that, I'll conclude my opening remarks and uh, turn it back over to, to Kevin. Great. Thank you, Michael. Give us a lot to think about there, a very broad uh, overview of, of the many topics that are, are at hand. So thank you, Michael. Victoria Virasingh is with Palantir Technologies. Victoria, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I work at Palantir Technologies. We are a data integration software company. So what does that mean? We essentially integrate disparate sources of data, provide a dashboard for the user at an organization to find patterns and trends in the data that they would not have been able to find before. This morning, I'm going to be talking about how big data is used in the community in two of our community-based projects. One is with Santa Clara County, and the other is with Team Rubicon. And I'd love to start you know, this conversation with a quick video of our work with Team Rubicon. Team Rubicon is a veterans-guided service disaster relief organization. So they deploy volunteers to regions affected by disaster and basically go into houses, muck out, and help families recover from those disasters. We started partnering the Team Rubicon to help them with the logistics of that to identify the highest uh, need families and individuals in a given region and to help distribute volunteers and resources appropriately. I uh, would love to play a quick video and then we can come back to the discussion. Palantir Technologies is a software company based in Palo Alto. We've come to help out with Hurricane Sandy, this organization called Team Rubicon, which is a group of veterans that provides disaster relief. The problem that Team Rubicon faces is there's a lot of people here in the Rockaways that need help. They need to identify those people, transfer that information to a centralized location very quickly, and then dispatch teams to go help those people and clean up their houses, essentially. When we first got here, Team Rubicon was recording their data on paper. The first thing we did is we ate all that information. Then we set up a system where residents are just walking up, there's a volunteer standing there with an iPad, 
putting their information into a web form that automatically creates an object in Palantir that is a request for help object. We're actually going to be looking for more of this while we're up here. The other primary way is we've got people with Palantir mobile devices, and they go out, they take photos of the damage itself, and they send that image and that data, and it creates an object in Palantir out of that. With that data, we use it as efficiently as we can, dispatch the work teams out to these sites. How many work orders did you guys get? We send computer scientists into the field. We showed up here and Palantir wasn't configured for this setting. We built it on the spot. We built the web flow in place. We built the ontology in place. We trained all of the volunteers here so that they knew how to use it. And five or six days later, they're doing disaster relief in a way that nobody ever has before. Palantir was founded with the motto that they were going to go out and solve really hard problems. Helping people in a disaster is one of the world's hardest problems. So as you saw in the video, that model is a model that we deploy to all of our partnerships, which is creating the product in our headquarters in Palo Alto, but really further developing that product out in the field. You know, we started in 2004. Um, we start. We were living in a post 9/11 world. Uh, our founders recognized the immediate threat of terrorism, and when we first started in the defense and intelligence industries. What we saw was, you know, massive amounts of data that was disparate, uh, that wasn't being connected, and that the result of that were decisions makers not being able to make data-driven decisions using an informed data set. And as we started looking around other industries, we saw the similar problem, data being disparate, not being connected, and not allowing decision makers to solve a problem that they were seeking to solve. And so as we moved in, into various industries, it wasn't that we were subject matter experts, but we were experts at the tech, and the problem is the same. And so by deploying the tech and working side by side with our partners, as you see with Team Rubicon, to customize our product and to customize tools that allow them to solve their problem, you know, we empower organizations to do their best work by us being able to do our best work. Team Rubicon, three years into the partnership, uh, very proficient user of Palantir. They boast having you know, many users uh, that are really good at using Palantir, even without us. Uh, you know, we've, Team Rubicon has been deployed to Houston, locally to San Jose, and every time they're deployed, we're sending engineers out there to ensure that each time we're bettering the platform, you know, we're upgrading the software to make it usable for the users on the ground. Uh, you know, it's really the, the combination between product and humans that allow them to be able to, to, ser to deliver ser uh, service to the people that they're trying to serve. Uh, you know, Team Rubicon is very specialized as a special antidote. You know, a lot of our Palantirians volunteer. Um, I went out six months ago to McHenry, Illinois. They had some flooding going on there. We, last weekend, we sent some volunteers to go out to, to Napa, Santa Rosa area. Um, so it's a, it's a really special partnership, but is continuing to be developed as we continue to work um, with their organization. Now, I'd like to switch over uh, to another issue facing our community. Um, you know, on any given night, there are more than 6,000 homeless individuals in Santa Clara County. Of that group, there are about 2,500 that are chronically homeless. In July of 2015, the county of Santa Clara launched Project Welcome Home, which is California's first pay for success project. As a quick overview, pay for success is, is a performance-based social services contract. So basically, uh, Project Welcome Home Pay for Success identifies a targeted outcome. In this case, it's lowering the amount of homeless individuals in Santa Clara County through an intervention. That intervention is abode services providing stable and secure housing for homeless individuals in the community. And the project is evaluated over time through a third-party independent evaluator. In our case, it's UCSF. Uh, to measure the success of the project. 
what do we do for Project Welcome Home? We are the centralized platform that allows users both at the county and, and abode to track, serve, and measure the outcomes of chronically homeless individuals in the system. The platform allows users to do three things. One, to deliver targeted service delivery. Second, to, de to, de uh, to um, deliver you know, public, publicly scarce government resources. And third, to measure outcomes. The users, both on the county end and both and abode services, are using an integrated platform that takes criminal justice system data, we take health and hospital systems data, we take the county homeless and management system, as well as abode lease management and case management system. We, can, we provide a platform that connects all of them so users can interact with the data, identify homeless individuals at their highest risk, and place them into secure uh, housing. Now, the data we're dealing with is really sensitive. This is you know, data that can identify a person. We're dealing with health data. All this data is really sensitive. So how do we ensure that we're protecting the data so we're protecting individuals that's being used in the system? And so the bulk of our involvement in Project Welcome Home in the first you know, year that we were involved was actually figuring this problem out. So this meant, you know, going through assessments, evaluating our product, and engineers literally embedding code into the product that would provide safeguards for this type of data. Uh, Palantir, when we, we were founded in 2004, we created our first, the first privacy and civil liberties team dedicated to just this problem. It's composed of attorneys to engineers um, to philosophy uh, to philosophy thinkers. And the idea is, you know, we're going to be working with really sensitive data and we're going to have users across a variety of organizations. We need to make sure that this data is protected and that the users can do three things, right? So use, the right types of users can access the right types of data. The second is the right types of information are being, are being allowed to be manipulated and to be changed and to be tracked. And the third is how can we have logs that actually monitor what users are doing? So in the event that someone, there's a bad actor, you know, we can go back and look at exactly the steps that they took within the platform to manipulate the data or to change things within, within the data ecosystem. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, concern of, you know, how do, we, how do we manage all of this with all these users? But by putting into place these guards, working directly with our counterparts, points at the county, at abode services, uh, we're reaching that target of delivering service uh, while ensuring that we're protecting the privacy and civil liberties of all of the clients that we serve. Thank you. Excellent, Victoria. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> exciting application of private sector technology for a public purpose and a public mission. And uh, I think that's resonating with, with a number of folks in our audience. So thank you very much for that overview. And finally, we'll turn to Rod Ogawa with the Silicon Valley Data Trust. Rod, you are up. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I have two disclaimers, maybe three. Uh, the first is I didn't get put on ties. Um, <laughs> and being a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz, this is really foreign territory anyway. Um, the second thing is I did not know what Chris was going to say in his opening uh, talk. Uh, but you'll see that the themes that he struck, particularly in his introduction, bear on the work that we're doing here. Uh, the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust um, aims to change the culture of data use by public schools and agencies in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley, for the purposes of the SVRDT, includes San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, and Santa Cruz County, which is my home base. Um, the mission of SVRDT is to, st is to stimulate change in the culture and practice of how data is responsibly and ethically used to develop actionable solutions to critical educational, health, and social problems. Um, ah, the, um, I guess the, the, the final disclaimer is, bear with me because I may have to refer, f refer to my notes and bear with me with the slides that are ch you know, chock full of content because I'm representing a team and each team member wanted to make sure that their stuff was included. <laughs> and so I may race through this pretty quickly uh, because of the time limit. Um, but we have a, a substantial amount of time after the talks uh, for you to ask questions about specifics. We can go back to the slides. So bear with me. Um, the, the, the basis for the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust is to link data between public schools and he public health and human service agencies, largely at the county level 
to inform the services that children receive, to inform programs, and to inform policymakers who govern those programs and agencies. Um, and in our county, um, the need is quite great. Um, for example, you know, we're talking about a student population of over 400,000 kids, and that's growing. Um, almost 40% are on free, free or reduced lunch, which means they come from low-income families. Um, academically, a large portion of our kids are performing poorly, and um, we, have, we have a substantial representation of ethnic, racial, and linguistics, linguistics groups that historically have been dubbed underserved by our agencies and, our, and by public education. So there's a great need there. And the idea is that combining data, across, sharing data across public agencies and public schools, we can put children at the center of the service. Um, and so you'll see that this SVRDT involves the three counties, the county governments in the three counties, the public schools in the three counties, and currently among the county agencies involved um, are behavioral mental health, child welfare services, and juvenile justice and probation, which as the counties themselves have, have deemed are those that are most directly involved in the provision of services to children and their families. Um, and so, Just, like I said, bear with me here. Um, okay, so what we're, yeah, we're, SVRDT is building a secure information sharing environment that connects 66 school districts to the data zone, which is the central educational data repository hosted by the Santa Clara County Office of Education. And it connects all the school districts potentially will, will connect all the school districts in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz counties um, to develop the legal documentation for cross-agency data sharing um, and to define the SVRDT research agenda. And I should say that this work is being supported by a generous grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And I should say that I should add that a person who was really critical in that effort to, to get the funding was Ann Campbell, the San Mateo County Superintendent, who put us, put us in touch with Chan Zuckerberg. Yay, Yay Ann. All right. Um, yeah, the headings are lost. OK. Um, one of the things that we learned very early in developing this, in developing SVRDT, is that trust, and this goes back to one of the comments that Chris made, that trust lies at the very heart of this. If, if, if the agencies don't trust this, if the people served by the agencies don't trust this, if the policymakers at the state and local levels who govern this don't trust this, it's not going to work. And so um, the first step in developing trust, as, it, as is always the case, is face to face. And so we spent over three years meeting with policy leaders, leaders of public schools, leaders from county agencies, families and communities, um, as well as university researchers to, to identify their commitment to this, the challenges, and the opportunities that they could identify in pulling this off. All right. In making this work, though, it was clear that we couldn't stop with the development of face-to-face -face trust, that we were going to somehow going to have to institutionalize trust systemically. And institutionalizing trust includes these components, policy, architecture, technology, and change integration. And again, I'm going to have to zoom right through this. Um, so in terms of, yeah, these are the, these are the four elements that, that are, will be in place to institutionalize trust across the agencies, between agencies and the policymakers, and between both and the communities they serve and the researchers at UC Santa Cruz who will be doing the data analysis to answer questions of importance to the, to the participating schools and, and health and human service agencies. Um, and so this is written by our lawyers, so it's a little wordy. Um, 
the first, the first step in, in developing the policy and governance system um, involves interagency information sharing agreements. We have a draft agreement which has been shared with the agencies and we're in the process of finalizing that. The second piece um, will be an enterprise memorandum of understanding which takes the basic elements of the interagency uh, data sharing agreements and operationalizes the specifics as to who's gonna, who will be authorized to get what data from whom for what purposes. Um, and then the final piece is a uniform, uniform consent, form that, consent form that will be used by all the participating agencies and the public schools to gain the consent of parents and guardians of the children whose data are being collected and used. Um, in addition to the sort of policy piece um, is the development of a secure information sharing environment. So there will be a technical architecture that will be in place that uh, will allow for the sharing of data that is held in the educational data repository as well as the data that are being warehoused by each of the, the, the nine participating agencies in the three counties. Um, and it's there that issues of security and privacy uh, will be dealt with on a technical basis. Um, yeah, and so as I was saying, trust lies at the very heart of this. And this goes back to something that Chris, Chris introduced in his talk. Um, and to do all of that will require continuing face-to-face -face contacts, policy and governance that secures privacy and security of data, as well as the technical architecture that does so on a technical basis, um, dealing with many of the issues that were already identified by one of the panelists. Oh, and we're back. And so let me close by saying we've, we have a, appreciated the support of all of, the, of all of the agency representatives, the representatives of public education, and by policymakers to the extent that the county Boards of Supervisors have adopted resolutions. The County Boards of Education have adopted resolutions supporting this work. Uh, Assemblymember Mark Stone from our area um, authored a, a joint resolution that was adopted last year by the Assembly and Senate naming SVRDT as a state pilot for interagency data sharing. And, and uh, Assemblymember Stone authored and we sponsored a bill, AB 597, that was signed by the governor a month ago that uh, amend state code which already allows for interagency data sharing within counties to now provide for sharing of data across county lines but allowing only our three counties to do so uh, again to serve as a as a pilot for the rest of the state. Rod, thank you for your leadership. Uh, it is indeed an uh, integrative, innovative approach uh, that we hope other regions will embrace but uh, yours is leading the way. This, this region is leading the way, and I appreciated that shout out to our superintendent, Ann Campbell, who has done such an incredible job for us here uh, in San Mateo County. So with that, thank you all on the panel. We do have about 20 minutes for some Q&A and some dialogue if uh, something triggered a thought or a question. Uh, Zach Ross from Assemblymember Berman's office is in the back. He is the microphone man right now. So if you raise your hand for questions, Zach will, uh, do his uh, Phil Donahue impression and get over to you. Does anybody even remember who Phil Donahue? Did I just did I just age myself? Okay. We have a question right here on the aisle. Ann Schneider. Hi, Ann Schneider, uh, Councilwoman, City of Millbrae. Uh, Palantir, it sounds intriguing. A number of us here serve on the County Emergency Services Council. We've had one data company come in and talk about how they could map hazard zones. But I'm also a CERT member, and I was a Red Cross logistics person. So I love the program. How can we learn more? And are you looking at incorporating all of the, the local disaster repair programs? Uh, yeah, well, if you head to our, our website, we have information about our, our Palantir Rubicon, but I'd be happy to chat with you after and give you a little more details of how we do that. I mean, uh, it, disaster relief is is big. I mean, I, it's it, reflecting on this past year, um, a number of regions, both in the U.S. and outside, have experienced 
tremendous impact from disaster relief. And it's something that, you know, I know there are a variety of companies that are looking at this, but, you know, our, our perspective is approaching it from a data, a data perspective. And the other part of this is the more that you grow your data repository, the better prepared you will be in the future because you'll have multiple case studies to look to look into. So, you know, I'm happy to chat about what specifically you're dealing with, what data systems, um, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, to kind of figure a way to, to use data for in our communities for, for good and to, to stay prepared and stay ahead um, of the curve. Other questions? Yes. Microphone coming your way. Victoria, Tom Gage from Marconi Pacific. Do you have data on uh, transportation? Uh, is that in your system and what might mm -hmm. you have been using it for? Sure. So just uh, a quick point of clarification. So we actually don't host any data. Um, the data stays with our partner organization. So what we do is we just give our platform. Our platform sits on top of existing data ecosystems. So you could put our platform in. You could take it out. Uh, no harm, no done. Um, our our objective is to help you as an organization make better sense of your data. We <coughs> never host the data. We uh, rely on you to be the actors of your stewards of your own data. Um, you know, we we kind of we stray away from even managing data systems. We like to go into organizations that already have um, a system of information. Um, in regards uh, to transportation, we don't currently uh, work with organizations that are looking at specific transportation data. Data, but you know we are involved in a number of initiatives in the community. My colleague Mila Zelka, if you could raise her hand in, in the back, leads a lot of our uh, transportation initiatives. So she would be a great person to talk to. Hi, my name is Rob Solano. I'm with the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center in. I just want to give a plug, Victoria, your, your software is great. There's a storyline that comes with it where you can actually be involved in any type of analytical data. And if someone stopped you and said, what's the progress relative to this product that you're doing? With the way Palantir is set up, you can instantaneously do a presentation with a prepared storyline already for the data that you've already prepared. So that's a plug for Palantir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, with our with Project Welcome Home, we have several different tools. So as you can imagine, the county has one objective, a boat has another objective, but UCSF wants people to measure outcomes. And so we actually have um, a tool that allows you to put, look, my, look at a macro view. And so you can actually see how many chronically homeless individuals have been in stable housing. And if they're not in stable housing, what services are they using? What services are they going back to? So you can better uh, transition your preventatives, your intervention, something that's better suited for that individual. So it allows you to go deep into one client or take a macro look and say, OK, in this part of Santa Clara County, we're experiencing large levels of increase in homelessness. In this county, things are actually working. And why are they working? So with, with that, and um, to your point, you can actually pull a report out. So if you're presenting um, to a ma to management, if you're presenting to someone, you can directly pull it off from Palantir, export it into an Excel or PowerPoint file, and then it's up there with um, up-to-date information. So it's important, I think, as we talk about you know big data, it's how can we consistently measure it and keep ourselves accountable um, to what we're doing. So it's not like you know we're getting we're getting lost in um, segments of data because we're trying to solve one problem, but let's keep ourselves on track and make sure that we're actually measuring our outcomes and hitting the objective that we initially set out to achieve. Other questions? Rod Chow has a question. Zach, we'll get you the mic. Don't know if I need the mic. Um, Michael, um, you talked about internal threats. In large organizations, how do you prevent the damage that a disgruntled government employee or contractor can do uh, to either, again, export the data, as we've seen happen, or to you know manipulate some of the, the outcomes and results. Yeah, thanks. That's a very <laughs> difficult security problem. Um, a lot of the industry and a lot of thinking has really been dedicated towards external threats, keeping the bad actors out. Um, more recently, people are thinking about okay, assume bad actors are going to get in. 
how do you find them within the environment? What you're describing is even more difficult, which is someone that has lawful, legal, you know, reasonable access to your system, um, you know, uh, making off with something uh, of value, uh, becoming basically an insider, an insider threat is what it's called. Um, there are a number of ways to deal with them, uh, all of which are kind of imperfect, um, I would say. So uh, the first is, you know, again, kind of approaching this from a, a theme of strategy is making sure that um, people don't have access beyond what they need access to, right? It's very easy for an administrator to set uh, kind of all access to all new employees. It's just very, very easy in human nature is generally to do what's easiest. So making sure that uh, your employees and your users have the right privileges set so that they cannot access what they should not be accessing uh, is very, very important. Um, you know, of course, doing uh, the typical employee, you know, screening that, that you normally do. Um, but these kinds of things only get you so far, right? I mean, uh, the NSA has some of the best security uh, in the world, and they, they missed Edward Snowden, right, um, amongst, amongst others who are less famous. So the insider threat's really uh, challenging. One of the ways is actually kind of a, a big data-themed solution, and, and again, this is kind of a big data conference. Um, you know, part of the issue is an insider... Uh, has this kind of normal, you know, uh, I keep calling it lawful, but, you know, whatever access to your system. So how can you judge what they're doing versus someone that's doing something illegal or external? And that's kind of a big data problem. So the way a lot of solutions and vendors approach this is they will basically um, gather and analyze data from your organization and try to determine a baseline of what normal behavior looks like. And then they will try to extrapolate, okay, this is anomalous behavior against that normal behavior and hope that the insider's activities leap out as anomalous and unusual. Um, that is something that uh, user behavior analytics companies uh, do. That's kind of what they specialize in. Um, and that's one way that, that industry and that vendors are trying to figure out the insider threat uh, issue. But this is, this is an ongoing problem. I think there's room for a lot more innovation here. Uh, but again, just to sum up, you know, try to do a good screening of your employees, manage their privileges uh, and their accesses, um, making sure they only access really what they need to. Um, and then you know, if you really do have a problem, then you're probably looking at a, a big data security solution like user behavior analytics to try to, to, try to uh, search through the needle in the haystack. It's a very, very difficult problem. And frankly, still is one even the government struggles with. While you're formulating your questions, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Supervisor Slocum, who has a question for the panel. Uh, Rob, this question's for you. Uh, <clears throat> it might be a little unfair, so forgive me. Uh, I'm curious about <clears throat> the notion that uh, kids being in the classroom each and every day is one of the paths to success for those students. And I know from looking through the data that truancy, I guess we still call it truancy, I'm not yes, sure, yeah. but kids not being in the classroom, missing class for one reason or another, uh, also affects those students. And the data is pretty startling if you, if you look at it. So the question is, how does your project um, you know, help with identifying those students who have a pattern of a truancy, and then what are some of the other uh, sort of side benefits that this regional data trust uh, could bring? It seems like um, a very powerful tool, but I'd be curious to hear uh, your ideas on that. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. The, um, let me preface my, my direct response by citing both Supervisor Slocum and Chris's comments about disruption. The Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust is not disruptive in that it's not changing what's actually being done in schools and health and human service agencies. It's laying a new ground on which schools and agencies stand and work. It can trigger, hopefully, disruption created by communities through policymakers and by people who work within the agencies and schools who use the data, who use the information um, in ways that change the way they provide services, change the way they coordinate services, as I said before, and placing the child very much at the heart or the center of our work. So to answer 
to answer Supervisor Slocum's question directly, for instance, as he, as he points out, truancy, that is a kid not showing up for school, has a very deleterious effect on their academic performance and thus on other aspects of their life. With the data zone, which is the data warehouse that the public schools will have access to, teachers, counselors, principals will have data that's uploaded every night. And so they will know which of their kids are missing a class, part of a class, an entire day on a day-to-day -day basis. So they can quickly move in and monitor kids' behaviors and intervene. Similarly, because of the, the ability to share data across agencies, as agencies see fit, a probation officer working in juvenile justice is working with, you know, has as one of her clients, a young man, she can go into to SVRDT, ask for data on this young man's school data, and see that he has been truant on Wednesday afternoons for the last two weeks, and before that was completely absent for a week. And so she could, the probation officer could then meet with the kid, have information that she otherwise wouldn't have to begin creating intervention on that side, as well as to contact the schools so that the schools and juvenile justice can work together given that shared information. Um, so specifically, you know, in terms of the delivery of day-to-day -day service at the service level, that's the kind of advantage that the data trust will provide. Similarly, and that's where we're beginning, by the way. We're, we've begun by working with people who are working at the case level to identify the data that each agency has to share and learning what the agency, other agencies can share, what information they would like to be able to tap across agency lines and across county lines. Um, the idea then is to build up the database so that data systems so that we can aggregate up so that we can use the data to evaluate programs, to inform the work that administrators are doing to organize programs, to organize instructional practices, to organize interventions in the other agencies. And finally, uh, to aggregate up, to aggregate data that will be provided to researchers who can sit down <coughs> with the practitioners and the, and the administrators and the policymakers to identify the questions that the agencies and schools feel that they need to have answered through research to improve, improve practice, programs, and policies. And then additionally, um, hopefully the researchers themselves have ideas to contribute, to say, you know, the literature says, you may not be aware of this, the literature says that such and such may be the case, what about our, you know, our, our collaborating to conduct research using the data in the data trust, which would be anonymized for the researcher's use, right? But which would not be anonymized, obviously, for the people working at the case level so that they can intervene based upon the, the intelligence that they gain uh, from the data that they can tap both within their own agencies or schools and from other agencies that are sharing the data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Uh, we have a question on the aisle. Hi, I'm Benny Lee, County of San Mateo, project manager for uh, uh, ISD, as well as a moonlighting councilman for City of San Leandro. <laughs> you know, actually, this question is uh, pretty important because when we talk about big data, we took, take a look at companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter. They basically can analyze data down to the details for the individuals, and they've you leveraged it for advertising and really targeting individuals, but for uh, county agencies or local agencies, uh, we have access to a lot of data. But one gap that seems to be missing is data science or data scientists, uh, particularly from a security perspective, from a usage perspective, and even from a medical perspective. Can you comment on the need for data science and data science scientists uh, for, with respect to government agencies and the need for that? Sure, I can take the first swing maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're describing what is probably one of the hottest career fields in the industry right now. Um, you know, along with big data, and I'm sure you, you know, Palantir knows this uh, just as well, uh, you have to have someone that knows how to analyze that big data, and, and the singularity hasn't, hasn't quite arrived yet, so uh, that does come down to really smart 
uh, people that know how to parse through this you know, volumes and troves of information. Um, no question that if you have uh, large data sets, you're going to need people that, that are able to do exactly that. The problem as I see it is, again, this is probably the most low density, high demand career in the industry. Um, and so, you know, a, a, a local government or a county government is going to have to be competitive with Google and Palantir and whoever else for this, for this very, um, you know, still very small segment of people that have the skill set. So, um, you know, until very recently, I was the CEO of a cybersecurity company, um, and uh, we were always on the hunt for uh, data scientists in, in one way or another, um, and uh, they could, you know, they could command a, a higher premium than a number of other uh, engineers and employees could. So I think this is a, uh, I, I see that as, as a real struggle for local governments is how do you actually attract and maintain that talent uh, when you have, you know, some of the biggest companies in the Valley, um, you know, after the exact same people. So I, I'd, I don't have a good answer for you, just a, a call to service maybe, right? That's what, that's what the, uh, the federal government does. That's what uh, the Department of Defense does, is say, do something here you can't do somewhere else. Serve your community, serve your country, serve um, you know, your, your fellow citizens and, and humanity, because um, it's going to be hard to compete with them on economics. You've identified something that uh, is a real workforce challenge for local governments. We at the state level have that same issue with the Department of Information Technology. And you know, how do you make uh, uh, government tech, if you will, sexy and uh, exciting and attractive uh, compared to Silicon Valley and Google and Facebook? It's a real uh, challenge for, for state government, I'm sure locals as well. Michael, I just wanted to say with you quickly, uh, you mentioned staying ahead, staying in front of the threats, the evolution of the threats. I guess my question is, you know, we've got local government folks here, we've got local nonprofit folks here, county government, um, and much of what you're referring to is uh, global in nature, and Chris identified some of those uh, big picture problems globally that we might enter. What's the next generation of, of threats, if you will? What, what, what's gonna keep some of these people up at night two years from now, yeah. three years from now? What are these emerging things that we'll be talking about at, you know, Connect 20? So the trend in, in cybersecurity is for what was once the purview of nation states to basically become commoditized and, you know, something that used to be only uh, accessible or doable by the Russians or the Chinese or us, um, eventually becomes cheap and pervasive enough that, you know, then you see criminal organizations start using it and then individual hacktivists and, and so on and so forth. So I would say, you know, what we're seeing affect um, you know, very large companies today will trickle down and start impacting uh, smaller companies tomorrow. So if I were in, you know, in local government or a nonprofit, um, I would be worried about, I would be worried about the weaponization of information. I would be worried about that. Uh, that is brand new. I don't think we have a good handle on that or a good answer for that at all. Um, I would be really worried about ransomware. Is everybody generally familiar with what ransomware is? Um, that is uh, really taking off, and we're seeing, I mean, it used to be this thing where it was kind of uh, done by, you know, organized crime, basically, largely coming out of Eastern Europe. Uh, now we're seeing actual countries engage in this, um, you know, North Korea, uh, other nations, um, actually doing this to, to, to wreak havoc and to gain, and to gain, um, to gain money, um, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, like actual schools are being hit with these things, right? And student data is being locked up and encrypted. Uh, hospitals, good Lord, they're, they're getting hit uh, all the time. And that trend is just gonna keep getting kind of lower and lower and lower until individuals are gonna be hitting, you know, getting hit with ransomware on their phones. Uh, there's not a good answer for that. Uh, I would be really, really worried about that on top of kind of the general, you know, you don't want your, uh, you know, uh, patient records lost in a data theft kind of thing. So this just kind of, you know, it's, it's not zero sum, it's additive, right? So all these kind of security things are adding on, on top of each other. But I'd be worried about the weaponization of information and I'd be worried about um, ransomware really if I were uh, a local uh, government or nonprofit. I think both of our panelists want to comment on that. We just have three minutes left, so we'll wrap up with these comments. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll just add a quick thought to the data scientist question. I think um, one thing that we should be careful of as data scientists, high demand um, in a lot of different industries, uh, is really instituting 
ethics into data scientists. I mean, these data scientists are going to have tremendous abilities um, to understand data. And one something that we're doing at Palantir through our privacy and civil liberties team is actually engaging with professors at Stanford University in their computer science programs and implementing uh, the curriculum and including pieces of ethics. So how can we? We're training, you know, we're training these computer scientists. You know, how can we institute ethics into a part of that to help them think about what is the consequence of what you're doing with this data? Who is this going to be? Who is this affecting? So, you know, we're training data scientists that are going to be immensely useful in a variety of fields, but also have in mind ethics, privacy, civil liberties, individual impact, community impact. So, um, you know, I think that through partnerships where you have industry embedding with universities, state and local government embedding with universities to train and say, this is what this is what we need, and this is the type of person that we're looking for, um, I think will be important in the future. Yeah, sort of to tack onto that, in terms of sort of the workforce issue, one of the things we can do is we can train them, right? And so at UC Santa Cruz, for example, we're seeking, we're submitting a proposal to NSF for a training program to train masters and PhD and doctoral students in data science and in the social sciences um, to prepare them to do this kind of work, to do big, big data work in the public sector. I mean, there are a lot of really good lawyers who could be making money on the, on the private side who are working in county agencies and in, in, and in public schools for less money, but because they understand that they can use the law for social good, we can use big, big data for social good as well. So the preparation, and then I think partnerships, as you were referring to, between the private sector and the public sector. You know, the private sector has expertise, they have technology that the public sector can, can't even really imagine. And I think there in, at that intersection lies some really positive opportunities for partnership. You were doing, you know, you were reporting about the work you were doing with um, natural disasters. You know, if we sort of scale that up to sort of say, to, to address social issues that are on a day-to-day -day basis in our local area, I could see Palantir and, UC, and, and SGRDT and UC Santa Cruz involved in a really useful set of partnerships that would solve problems, but also address specific issues like the whole um, human resource piece. On that optimistic note, let's thank our panel for the discussion. Thank you all for your questions. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, who will be introducing our next segment, the next Connect Talk, Supervisor Warren Slocum. Thank you. Well, as you all know, election hacking, Russian interference in our uh, presidential election is all over the news. Just turn on CNN any night of the week, and you too can get educated on um, what's been going on. I've known about Barbara Simmons for a very long time since uh, my role as Registrar of Voters and the whole uh, electronic voting um, scare, if you will, and have followed her work and have always been very uh, impressed by her thoughts regarding election security. And while she's a computer scientist, while she's a computer scientist, she believes, I think, still in paper ballots. Um, so that's sort of an interesting dichotomy. Um, Elections has always been a passion for me, and I'm so pleased that uh, Barbara Simmons has uh, joined us this morning. And so at this point, let me not take any more of her time and introduce to you uh, Barbara Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. It's awfully good to meet you. Okay. Really nice to meet you, too. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's see. Oh, so I don't need my picture. Okay. Um, just in, in comment to the previous panel, uh, I was really pleased to hear about all this joint work being done with uh, public-private institutions, with universities and corporations. And I just wanted to add another potential source of help, and that is professional societies. So in fact, uh, I'm a former president of ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, which is the largest and oldest educational uh, computer science society in, in the world, actually. and um, we have a, a 
a component called USACM, which is the US Public Policy Committee of ACM, and there are a lot of concerns about some of the issues that were just being addressed in the last panel. So if anyone is interested in trying to uh, work cooperatively with ACM, uh, please see me after the talk. So um, I was assigned the, the title of election hacking, and I decided to make it a little bit more positive um, because we actually know how to deal with that. We actually have a solution. So that's why the title is, actually, is protecting our elections. Uh, I think you'll all agree that security in elections is a voting rights issue. Um, basically, the ultimate form of voter disenfranchisement is to go to the polls and then not have your vote counted or not have it counted correctly. So security is very important to uh, basically, as I say, voting rights. Um, vote and, and the requirement, and I'm sure all election officials agree with this, that votes should be correctly recorded and counted. So getting back to the negative part, why do 2018 and 2012 matter? Uh, and here are a couple of quotes. I'm sure you've seen the James Comey quote. They'll be back in 2020. And by they, in this case, he meant, I believe, the Russians, although this can certainly apply to other nationalities and organizations as well. They may be back in 2018. And one of the lessons they may draw from this is that they were successful because they introduced chaos and division and discord and so doubt about the nature of this amazing country of ours and our democratic process. And to be bipartisan, since uh, Comey is a Republican, here is a quote from Democrat Senator Mark Warner, co-chair of the Senate Intel Committee, saying, we need a whole government approach to voting security. And again, I think everybody here agrees with that uh, sentiment. If states don't proactively move forward, very shortly we'll be getting into primary season 2018. He was calling for states to take security steps for the upcoming election midterms. So. Uh, I'm sure that this point has been forcefully made already. Computers ain't perfect. All large programs have software bugs. And so people who haven't really given much thought to the voting machine issue will frequently say, well, but what's the big deal? You just record the votes and count them. It's, it seems pretty trivial. But in fact, these voting machines tend to have a large amount of software in them because they have to work everywhere. And uh, again, as I'm sure you know, election laws vary enormously over the, all around the country and even within states. You know, you can have vote for three out of five. You can have rotation of ballots, as we saw with the recall of uh, Governor Davis. You can have um, uh, straight party voting. So there are all kinds of issues, and these voting machines have to deal with all of them. Um, and of course, as we've seen, Major software vendors like Apple and Microsoft are sending out frequent software fixes. Many of these are to fix security problems. And if it were possible to write perfect software, then Apple and Microsoft would do it, right? Uh, it's not possible because software tends to be very complicated. And sometimes a change over here will affect something over here that you knew nothing about. So that's why these fixes are frequently sent out. And of course, voting software again, because it's large and complicated, is vulnerable to bugs or malware that could impact election results. So we use computers almost everywhere in our elections now. And, and, and Warren said that I support paper ballots, which I do. But the paper ballots are associated with computers, actually. And, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so the question is, what happens if a hack is discovered months after an election? Uh, so, for example, the Yahoo breach started in 2014, but it was revealed only fairly recently. The DNC breach was not discovered for six months. The Equifax hack was discovered at least two months after the breach, and that affected 143 million people. And uh, even after it was discovered, a couple of months ago, uh, a security person found that there was malware on the Equifax site that you were supposed to go to to deal with this breach. And if you clicked on it, you would uh, be downloading malware onto your computer. That's a bit irresponsible, in my opinion. So internet voting, uh, we, just, we just define as providing blank ballots over the internet. I mean, I mean as, as, provided, as, 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 as sorry, providing blank ballots over the internet is not internet voting because it's a blank ballot. Now, there's still security issues with that, but it's relatively secure, certainly compared to the reverse of sending voted ballots over the internet. And that is what is fundamentally insecure. That includes web-based voting, email with PDF attachments. Most faxes are now sent over the internet, and smartphones, of course, 
go over the internet. So um, basically, our recommendation for a long time has been no internet voting, no return of voted ballots in any way over the internet. And I should also mention that uh, internet voting is a threat to the secret ballot. And in fact, uh, in the, there are military voters who have been given the opportunity to return blank ballot, to return voted ballots over the internet, and they have to sign a statement saying they give up their right to the secret ballot. And I think nobody should be put in a position of having to do that. So here's an example of why internet voting is a bad idea. And um, you'll notice that all of these entities have been hacked, right? <clears throat> And this is only a short list. I mean, there are a lot that I could, a lot more I could have added. And then we have this recent NSA attack. So that was just mentioned, referred to in the last in the last panel. This is so. This is these are quotes from the New York Times article of a couple of days ago. The agency, which was is regarded as the world's leader in breaking into adversaries' computer networks, failed to protect its own. After six, 15 months of investigation, we still don't know if. Rush, if it was hacked by Russia, an insider leak, or both. So again, that was another question that came up about insiders. The people investigating this NSA hack really don't know, at least they don't state publicly that they know. And finally, and this is particularly worrisome, the NSA's cyber weapons have now been picked up by hackers from North Korea to Russia and shot back at the United States and its allies. And this is noteworthy for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, we just heard about what's happening with ransomware and so on. When it comes to election hacking, Democrats in 2016 were tended to be the victims. But what this is saying is that anybody can be a victim. Anybody. And Republicans in Congress, I think, are getting that. I think they understand they, too, could be, could be hacked by some other country that doesn't like them. So what are electronic voting machines? I, I don't know. I guess people here are not all election officials, right? So I should probably define this. OK. So um, there are things called direct recording electronic. And these were the machines that first, we had them in California for a while. In Palo Alto, we had them when I voted there some years ago. These are these typically touch screen machines that you touch. And it records your vote in the internal memory of the computer. Remember, these things are all computers. So they record your vote in the internal memory of the computer. Initially, almost all of them were paperless. So there was no way to do a recount. And they were sold to election officials because the vendor said, these are completely safe, completely secure. Don't worry. They've been federally certified, although the federal certification was very weak and didn't really check very well for security. But they didn't mention that part. Uh, and you push a button at the end of the election. You get the results. You go home. And then new and shiny. and. You know, everybody loves computers. So th there was a massive move to purchase these, and many were purchased in California. Um, so that's one, one type of uh, machine. The other is the paper ballot, which we tend to use here. Certainly, I live in San Francisco. We vote with paper ballots. We put the ballots into a scanner, and the scanner tabulates them. It, it reads them and tabulates them. That scanner has a computer. So even though you know, Warren said I support paper ballots, which I do, because these DREs are terrible. The paper ballots are still tabulated by scanners, and you still have to check the scanners because they are computers. So, um, and, and then I just want to correct one, um, one misconception that uh, statements have been made that com when, when the voting machines are not connected to the internet, they can't be hacked. This isn't exactly true. Even if they are not connected to the internet, they tend to be programmed, they're programmed using other computers. So the programming that has to be done is the names of the candidates, where they are on the ballots, and so on and so forth. And this is done by computers that could be connected to the internet. It takes only a fraction of a second to download malware. Once the malware has been downloaded, it can be transferred from the computer that programs the voting machines to the voting machines via portal memory, and then those voting machines have been hacked. And I know I'm supposed to be up. Can I just do one more? Because I want to get to the solution. <clears throat> so we need to check on, on election computers. The solution is paper ballots and manual post-election ballot audits. And, and these are called risk-limiting. The best kind are called risk-limiting audits, uh, which 
verifies that the computer declared results are correct. These were invented by Philip Stark, who at the time was the chairman of the statistics departments at UC Berkeley. He's now an associate dean. He's done a lot of hands-on work with election officials, implementing these in various places. And my hope is that I can uh, convince people, in fact, we're working on trying to get California to uh, adopt risk limiting audits statewide. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. So let's thank Barbara one more time. Thank you, Barbara, for coming here to Connect 17. And if you're following along in your program, it's now time for a break. We'll resume at 1020. And there are refreshments in the back, and I'm sure you've all found the restrooms and so forth and so on. So let's take a break. Thank you all.